Silvius Traders Lounge, in partnership with Scope Markets, welcome you to yet another webinar where we learn, trade, and profit. We shall be giving you trading insights on technical analysis, fundamental analysis, risk management, and trading psychology. Today's guest is Rita Batra Batachira, and our theme is Basic Fundamentals of Risk Management for the Retail Trader. So Mr. Rito's trading bio. Mr. Rita Brata or Rito has wide ranging experiences as a professional quantitative trader, investment strategist and technologist. Rito earned a master's degree in engineering and computational biology from the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay, India. In addition to his experience as a quantitative consultant in various hedge funds, and a faculty member and student mentor at World Quant University, that is wqu.org. He is co-founder of True Risk Labs. Website is www.truerisklabs.com, and it is a startup that applies machine learning and artificial intelligence to predict the market and guide portfolio strategies. Rito is also the head of research and trading strategies for Crimson Black Capital, website is crimsonblack.ai, which is a London-based hedge fund that was nominated in 2020 for H HFM Global Hedge Fund Awards for the best equity hedge fund in its category. In parallel, Rito continues to serve as an advisor and mentor on the board of many US-based hedge funds. Rito's passion, however, lies in trading, and he is a full-time professional trader and trades the Indian futures and options markets through a variety of automated algorithmic strategies focusing on both short-term momentum and long-term delta neutral positive theta plays. Rito is a long-standing member of Mensa and holds multiple software patents and journal publications in diverse fields from computational biology to customer experience management. Thank you so much, Mr. Rito, for being here with us today and for, making, and for making the time to come over for our webinar. Briefly talk to us, all right, sorry. Briefly talk to us about your trading journey as a quantitative full-time trader and finding your path working for hedge funds. Also assessing risks given your experience at True Risk Labs. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's a great honor being here. Uh, as far as my um, path uh, to trading is, uh, what I can talk about is that I come from a computational background, right? So that's what my engineering is about. And um, before being becoming a full-time trader, I used to be a consultant in some of the leading IT uh, consulting firms in the world, like uh, Oracle and Tata Consultancy Services and stuff. So uh, trading always has so the bulk of trading bit me almost very early in 2007, 2005, 2006, when I started developing trading systems on my own, right? I realized it very early on that uh, to be consistently successful in the stock markets, you need to have a set of rules by which you need to trade. However simple those rules need, uh, may be, it needs to be rule-based. Now, rule-based doesn't also, uh, always mean that you need to have a program uh, or, or an algorithm to run it. It might be a set of rules that you write on a piece of paper as long as you follow it consistently, right? Because otherwise, uh, uh, psychological uh, uh, impact of your own trading psychology on uh, uh, trading is very high, right? It's very uh, easy to be fearful. It's very easy to be greedy and make mistakes. So. Uh, I started kind of um, uh, dabbling with stocks about in, I think, 2004, 2005. By 2013, I think I had a, a fairly stable trading system, an algorithmic trading system. And that's that point, I left my day job. I became a full-time trader. I have been trading full-time uh, kind of, as a professional trader for the last what, now, seven, eight years now. Uh, all of that trading has been fully algorithmic, fully rules-based fully automated. Uh, during this journey, obviously, I uh, kind of, uh, uh, I got, I was, I, I formed partnerships with uh, various similar-minded people in US and UK. 
and uh, so i have been on i have had a couple of startups uh, hedge funds uh, startups that i did all of them have done fairly well and i have all uh, what has interested me in recent times is application of artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in trying to find out uh, at our trading edge you see uh, uh, why artificial intelligence and machine learning because uh, uh, how i look at it is that trading overall came in waves right the way you trade the first wave was fundamental investing right the warren buffer buffet benjamin graham kind of investing where you're looking at value stocks and you um, you do a lot of research on the fundamental metrics of a company you buy that stock and then you hold on to it for a long period of time right so if warren buffet has a very um, uh, whenever you ask that what is your favorite holding time for a stock he generally tends to say that uh, is forever i never want to sell a stock right i would i really like to hold on to a good stock forever right so these are very long holding periods based on fundamental analysis then around the 1990s they uh, there came a new breed uh, 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 let's say the 1980s or slightly before that you have the chartists right who looked at charts who started drawing uh, support resistance lines and uh, started drawing trend lines and they started trading according to that 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 was kind of like the second wave the third wave was the advent of the quants that's when the the hedge funds like renaissance world quant right they said okay forget the charts forget the fundamental uh, metrics to me this is a maths problem this is a data problem so whether it's fundamental analysis or charts i can convert everything to data points or price patterns i am going to use statistical data mining techniques and i am going to try to find patterns and trade according to that to me it doesn't matter whether i am trading a stock of uh, general motors or i am trading a stock of tesla or i am shorting microsoft to me it's just a series of data if the pattern is there i am going to short it so that's when the computer started taking over and then you, and, and all of us know right how how well renesa did how well volquant did right how well millennium did manage it did right and all of them are fully automated algorithmic trading funds right so that has been around for 20 years now another shift is happening which is towards the usage of artificial intelligence and machine learning because that again provides a little bit of an edge that standard quantitative methods cannot provide so that remains the area of my interest and all my startups and everything that i tend to do has been in that field and um when it comes to also assessing risks what has been your experience at uh, true risk clubs or what led to um you starting out with uh, true true risk clubs yeah so in true risk clubs is um, what we essentially do is that we we are a data company so <clears throat> we use uh, we mm, so you have heard of alternative data right so our uh, standard data for stock markets is essentially fundamental data which is the data of a company and uh, then is data of price volume data right how how price fluctuates with time and stuff right so that's standard alternative data is essentially data from different other sources which might not have a direct uh, bearing on the price of a stock or a commodity or a currency but it might have an indirect bearing right so for example gdp growth or sales of let's say consumer wear in us price of crude oil how how can price of crude oil affect the stock price of general motors it's not a very easy connection right but there might be a connection so these are alternate or how uh, rainfall data satellite imagery data now over time over the last 10 years 7 so to 10 years people have started recognizing that this alternative data sources can be used to do two things have slightly better predictions uh, of stock market directions and also have a better hold on the risk aspect of portfolios right so for example if you see that us a very simple example if us employment rate is slowly peaking right it might tell you that if you are holding lots of consumer uh, durables in your portfolio you might be holding a lot of risk right because employment is going up so at, at some point uh, discretionary spending is going to decrease and hence the price of um, how well your uh, retail consumer good companies do are going to be it might be fall so that's the risk that you are holding that's the risk 
that might not be immediately visible in the price of the stock, but it's there because it's coming, right? If unemployment is peaking, slowly something like this is going to happen. And then all of a sudden, one in a uh, two, three days, you might have a big correction in the prices of uh, consumer durables or um, other consumer stocks, right? So that's that aspect, right? So the thing is, this is the concept of hidden risk, right? Risk that is not immediately visible, risk that is not very easy to understand by just looking at stock data, stock uh, stock market data, right? You might see that, um, let's say, uh, the stock price of a company like Target, right? Target is in retail. They sell, uh, they have all these malls and they, uh, they sell stuff, right? So the, that might be in a nice uptrend. And so it might look like a very good buy, but in an alternative data set, you might all of a sudden see that unemployment is peaking and you might, and, and from a satellite imagery data, you might see that the, so you see, they, they have very, very interesting satellite imagery data, which tracks retail location. They see what, how, if you see the parking space outside a big Target mall or a big Costco mall or a big Walmart mall, they take satellite imagery data and try to see how full is those parking spaces. That if it's full of cars, it tells you that there are lots of people visiting the uh, uh, that mall, right? There's lots of buying is happening. Whether buying is happening or not is only going to be visible to you in the stock market data from when the company releases its results, its quarterly results, right? So from let's say from January to March, if it's doing well or is it, it has done badly, you will only know in March when the company releases those results, right? And the stock price might react then or might start reacting towards the end of February. But if you look at the satellite imagery data of how full are the parking spaces outside target malls on average across US, you might see, guess what? From January itself, the uh, all those parking lots are empty. Actually, nobody's in visiting the mall, right? So you have a much, you can react much earlier. It's, it doesn't still mean the stock price is going to drop, right? Because stock prices have their own minds. It, there's a, there's a questions of liquidity. There's questions of who is holding. But you at least now have an idea of the term, what, we are, what I mentioned is hidden risk. So there's a risk out there, Target or any other company. That I use the name Target just like that. that any other, maybe those retail locations are not doing so well maybe that is still not reflecting in the stock price, but at some point in the future that will reflect, right? So that is what we do at True Risk Labs. We try to use alternative data sets to make predictions about stock market directions and also about the hidden risk in a stock. Uh, so that's one way we want to do it in True Risk Labs and then other, other companies and other hedge funds. Everybody nowadays, the top guys, they use alternative data sources to try to figure this out so that they can react just a little bit faster. All right, thank you for that. And um, at True Risk Labs, you mostly concentrate on the stock market. Um, do you do this kind of data for, or this kind of research for commodities maybe? Or you specialize mostly in the stock market? No, we specialize in equity. Uh, so we uh, uh, specialize, we, we cover the uh, US Russell 3000 stocks. So we are essentially focused only on US stock markets and the US equity markets. But for uh, when, you, when it comes to like things like commodity or retail and stuff. So we might have specific predictions for the stocks which are uh, deeply affected by fluctuations in commodity prices, right? So for example, a gold mining company, right? Or a company that produces steel, right? A company that is heavily dependent on uh, crude oil, right? So we might have predictions specifically for those. So we would be looking at commodity prices, but for us, commodity prices is an input, right? It's not something that we predict. So we would be looking at prices of gold, prices of silver, prices of crude, natural gases, naphtha, all that stuff, right? But based on that, we would like to understand how some company which are dependent on that is going to do. So our focus is equity. All right, thank you. And um, any advice that you could give to new traders on how to mitigate risks? Uh, see, that's a very uh, long and heavy topic. Uh, so I can make a small presentation on it if you want. 
So I have prepared a couple of slides, but uh, uh, if, if, if I have to kind of um, summarize this in yes. one line, I would yes. like to say that for any trader, so whether you're a fundamental trader, whether you're a technical trader, whether you have some software you're using to kind of make automatic trades, ultimately, no formula, no mathematics, no backtest results are going to prepare you for the actual risk that you face in the markets, right? Uh, the markets are much tougher than any formula you can dream of, right? So uh, a very simple example, like in the 2008 crash, right? All the US hedge funds, including the European hedge funds, they used a, a formula of risk where, by which they used to measure risk. It was known as VAR, right? Value at risk. I'm, I'm sure many of our uh, listeners have also heard about it. Value at risk. And it was, uh, it was believed that value at risk is a very good measure of the risk in your portfolio, right? So if you're a fundamental investor, you could you, you could have used a formula like value at risk to assess your risk. If you're a technical investor, you still could have done that, right? So it was supposed to be very um, robust, very versatile, and very good. When the market crashed, anybody who depended on value at risk to um, uh, estimate their uh, risk of a portfolio, they all got it wrong. They all got it wrong. Everybody lost serious amounts of money because value at risk had some issues, right? The thing is you only find out about what issues you had, that formula had after the event happens, correct? You, you don't, it's only after you see that the formula fail, you know, okay, there's a problem with this formula. I need to take into uh, aspect some other things, right? So my simple advice would be you, you, ri you risk as much as you can afford to lose. Risk enough so that when you make a gain, if you don't risk anything, you're never going to make a gain, right? So when you make a gain, it should be meaningful. For example, if, if uh, your expectation is that every time you trade, if you bet a dollar, you get two dollars, right? If, if, if that's roughly what you do. And so if you lose the trade, you will lose a dollar. If you win the trade, you will win two dollars, right? And then, uh, and if a meaningful win for you is about, let's say, $10, this means you have to bet $5, right? So that if you win, you will get $10 That's a meaningful win for you. And then hopefully $5 is enough so that even if you lose it, you're not going to lose sleep over it. So bet as much as you're very comfortable with so that you can still sleep happily at night without worrying where will the market open tomorrow morning. And if it opens 5% down, I'm going to have to sell my house. Don't bet that way. Bet enough that you can happily trade it. You can sleep peacefully at night. And, and when you win, it is still something meaningful. If you bet extremely low, then you, whether you win or lose is not, is not going to matter. But just find out. And that possibly is much better way of really trading. If you want to trade for a living, right? If you're trading for fun, you're trading for excitement, that's a different thing. Right, but if you have to trade for a living, you you can only bet as much I could afford to lose without losing sleep, and just about enough that is meaningful when you win. Formulas is a completely different thing. It's it's better not to depend on them unless you're an absolute expert in the field. All right, thank you. And any advice that you could give to traders on the use of AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning in trading? Is it something you uh, Yeah, so the thing is, um, <clears throat> uh, in recent times, uh, AI has become a buzzword, right? Everybody talks about AI. So whether it's being self-driven cars or whether it is uh, even chatbots that if you have chatbots on WhatsApp, right? When you can directly talk to them and the AI response, right? And uh, auto trading. Um, everybody talks about AI. I I'm sure if, you, if I just do a Google search, saying artificial intelligence, stock market trading, there going, we will have millions of hits, right? There's going to be websites who says, okay, pay me $20. I have a big, big AI power trading system for you, which is going to make you rich, right? Uh, this thing's everywhere. The thing is, 
Um, and I have been a practitioner of AI, right? So um, I have, so my true risk labs is an AI based company, uh, Vector Capital Hedge Fund, and even Crimson Black, uh, where we trade. We all we use um, lots of serious AI. Uh, it has been my experience, uh, and also from my teaching experience at Walcott University, that using AI for trading is it's not a magic pill. It's not something that, okay, you use AI and you immediately uh, have a system that's going to start printing you money from tomorrow, right? Uh, it's not that easy. Nothing is that easy in the markets, right? If a trader is interested in the usage of AI for the stock markets, he's much better served of not trying to buy those AI system for anyone or kind of trying to take a plug and play system. It, it will require a lot of learning. It will require a lot of understanding of what the AI is doing and what the AI can do. The AI cannot, as I said, it's, it's not a holy grail, right? It, it can be one of the different tools you have in your repository to make better trading decisions. For example, charting is a tool set, right? So if you see, if you, if you can look at a chart, and you can draw a support line, you can draw a resistance line, you can draw a trend line. That gives you a bit more information about the stock. Na? If a stock comes to a support, it is most likely to bounce back from the support. If a st stock go goes and slowly hits a resistance, uh, whether it's a stock or a commodity or ETF or whatever, if it goes, hits a resistance line, it is most likely to correct from the resistance line. So that's a, that's a tool you have, right? To be able to draw support line, resistance lines. To, uh, have a fundamental analysis, that's a tool. AI can become another tool, but like you need to spend a lot of time to really understand how to do very good fundamental analysis, right? You need to know, learn how to read balance sheets. You need to learn what parameter makes sense for which company and uh, the kind of fundamental parameters that you look for in a technology company is not going to be the same as you look for in a utility company. Technology companies have very high PEs, right? Because uh, they generally have a very high uh, forecasted earnings. Uh, forecasted, yeah, so, so the expectations of price to earning is much higher. A cyclical will have a very low PE. So just by looking at PE, you cannot distinguish between those two companies. And that requires learning, right? You have to take time to learn. Similarly, AI takes a lot of learning that what kind of AI systems work what kind of doesn't work? What gives you false results? It looks very good, but it doesn't work very well out of sample, right? So my suggestion would be that, yes, AI, I think it has a fair amount of power, which cannot be captured in the traditional modes of investing, like fundamental, technical, or quants. AI can give you a new toolkit that is not present in the other ways of investing but it will require a serious amount of effort. So get into it only if you're ready to give the effort. Don't buy it off by $50 from someone. Those You're just going to end up losing a lot of money. That $50 is definitely gone. And when you start trading in the markets, you will lose more money. There's no shortcuts by using AI here. Okay, thank you for that. And um, you had mentioned a little bit about risk to reward ratios when you were giving the example of um, like risking $5 to get to $10. Um, so what would you advise a trader um, who's trading like commodities or precious metals uh, and even currency on the importance of position sizing and risk to reward ratios? Okay. Um, I cannot overemphasize the importance of position sizing and maintaining a, a good risk to reward ratios. You see, most of the talk in the market, and if you, if you, um, when you generally uh, kind of reach an, uh, a kind of a, a trader who is just starting his journey or if you read newspapers, everybody is focused on entry. They want to know what is a good signal, right? Shall I buy this stock? Shall I buy this? Is gold, uh, the, the, recently gold has a big rally, right? And so everybody all of a sudden interested in gold and say, okay, is gold overpriced? Shall I short it? Or is there's a lot of entry left? Uh, gold can still rally, shall I buy it? So everybody's interested of where to enter, right? Shall I buy? Shall I sell? That's the question. 
that generally is only 10% to 20% of a profitable trading system, right? The most important aspect is the aspect that you mentioned. How do you position size? What, to, what is your risk to reward ratios, right? So generally, obviously I'd like to have a, a, as high a risk to reward ratio as possible, right? But so it's not always possible. So the thing is that um, I would encourage people Generally, this is what I say that do a back test, do a back test across a long length of data, right? See what is your average risk to reward, the, what is your average risk, right? So when you do a back test, you'll be able to find out parameters like what is your max drawdown? What is your maximum historical drawdown, right? What is your mean historical drawdown? And what is your average compounded annual growth rate, right? whatever be your trading system. Let's say you're doing a simple moving average crossover system for trading gold. But it will, if it would, uh, and if you test the results over 20 years of data on a daily trading part, you will get some trades, then you will get some, um, uh, your, your ma a maximum drawdown value you will get, you will get a CAGR, a return value, right? Uh, my uh, suggestion would be to always try to, you see, there is no, I said a holy, holy grail trading system that will only get you into the uh, winning trades and uh, avoid all the losing trades, right? You will both win, you will both lose. There's no use, and you can tune your system to a certain extent, but beyond the point, there's not much you can do. The focus should be that given a positive expectancy trading system, what is a positive expectancy trading system? A system that on average makes money, right? So. It's not a system that on average gets more trades right. It, the system might have, it might have a win rate of 30%, which means out of every 10 trades it makes, only three of them are profitable, seven of them lose money. But it might be that on those three trades that you make money, let's say you make $20 each. On the seven trades that you lose money, you lose only $2 each. So out of the three trades, $20, you made $60 win. On the seven trades that you lost $2, you lost $14. So you still won how much? 60 minus 14, which is $46, right? So out of 10 trades, you made $46. So you still have a positive expectancy system, right? So every time you make a trade, there's an expectancy that you are going to win. Now, given such a system, if you have a negative expectancy system, there's nothing you can do, which basically means you're going to lose money when you trade, right? But if you have a positive expectancy system, the focus should be to position size at the areas of the lowest risk so that you can put up a much higher position. What does it mean? It means that Consider, so every trading system, and uh, for uh, especially for retail traders or uh, anybody who is uh, not a big hedge fund, uh, you will tend to have a stop loss. When you trade, you need to have a stop loss to trade. So let's say if you're entering a commodity gold, let's say a gold ETF, let's say at $100, right? Maybe your stop loss is at $95, right? Now the point, so your, your, your trading system has given a, sig a buy signal at $100, so you're going to enter. Where's your stop loss? Your stop loss is $95. So on that trade, your risk is $5. Based on your back test, you see that your average, average win is let's say about $7, right? Based on your back test, you need to back test it. Otherwise, how will you know? So on this trade, your risk reward is only $7 by $5 because you don't know whether this will be a big winner or, a, or an average trade. So you can only go by the average number, correct? So it's not a very high uh, expectancy trade, right? It's about one is to one. Yes. But sometimes it might be so that your stop loss is only $2 away, right? But your win is still $7. That's a very high expectancy trade. Now, given your stop loss is so close, you can put up a higher quantity, right? Because you can say on every trade, I am going to risk $10. I'm going to risk $10. So even if, if I get hit out of my stop loss, the max that we lose is $10. Now, when your stop loss is $5 out, you can only put two positions in, right? Because you're, you can lose $10 on each position, your stop loss is $5 out. 
you can only lose you can only put two positions to stay within that ten dollar risk parameter but when your stop loss is only two dollars out you can put in five positions right which means if you win now you're going to really win big so your focus of your entire system development is, is to be able to generate such a system which at least sometimes gives you this high risk reward trades where your stop loss is very close right so that you can put up a higher quantity for the same amount of risk because when you put up a higher quantity even if you win the your average win rate which is i said let's say seven dollars right so in the first case you put in two positions the max you're going to win is roughly around 14 dollars because you have a seven dollar expectancy right in the second position with the same risk the risk is same right just because your stop loss is close you will put up five positions now you can win 35 dollars right so what is your risk reward in the first case your risk reward is about 1.2 here the risk reward became much higher than that because you were risking yeah, only 10 dollars you, you got a reward of 35 dollars it became 3.5 right it become double or triple of that so that's the idea so i think every system developer again irrespective of how you trade if you have a stop loss you should look to put in more positions when your stop loss are closer so you can put in more positions with the same amount of risk you should put in less positions when your stop loss is higher so that you can maintain the same risk you don't overburden yourself with a bigger loss all right that's fantastic advice thank you for that um, now just uh, very briefly before uh, you make your presentation um, when it comes to long-term investing and also short-term trading um, what would you say are the key differences when it when you're using quantitative models um, for long-term investing and also for intraday short-term investing or trading uh, uh, is it the difference is uh... It's, I, I would say it's a completely different ball game because uh, you know in a long term trading you are uh, in short term trading is actually heavily competitive right because that's the region that's the space in which all those big hedge funds are there uh, that's the space in which uh, lots of algorithm algorithm trade happens right so a key difference is that there's lots of noise so when you look at a fundamental uh, at, when you uh, look at stock prices um, there are lesser trends and more noise in the lower time frames so you need to be really agile speed becomes an issue having very um, advanced models becomes an issue average win becomes actually becomes much lesser so in a, in a short term trading system you're not going to make very big wins right so since you're not going to make very so consider this consider that if you look at the price of apple let's say over a six month period apple might move from 100 to 300 right but over a one day period the max apple will possibly move to 100 to 102. now if you're trading intraday the kind of positions you're going to the kind of profits you can make will be only be in that range of two dollars right or maybe even much lesser than that hence at intraday levels, the amount of slippages and the brokerages that you pay becomes very critical part of your trading system development. For example, consider this, that every time you trade, you pay $1 as brokerage, right? Now, if your maximum win is $2, $1 is 50% of your maximum win, right? In a, in, so in intraday trading system, slippage, brokerage, commissions, this becomes a very important part. As a result, internet trading system works well for the big guys or when you're paying very low brokerage or very low slippage and you have a very fast and very efficient system. It's right. Slightly longer term trading, you don't really worry about those things. You can look for really long trends. And it's so it's, it's a completely different. It's very difficult for me to kind of really lay down the differences in a short span of time because i think it's a completely different game uh, advanced traders can try to uh, obviously uh, try to get into uh, internet trading retail traders who are just starting off i think should stick to slightly longer time frames uh, th that's where you can find a big much bigger trends and you can uh, make investments and be ready to ride out the wave over a long period of time 
Thank you. So the broker fees and all those uh, fees and uh, costs that go into trading do really take a big chunk of uh, your profitability in the short term. So that is something to factor in, in, into your trading. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, thank you. So trading insights from Mr. Rita Brata, that is debunking market myths and that pervade things that investors and traders believe without really understanding and how that adds on to risk. So Mr. Rita is going to give us his presentation. You're free to share your screen. Sure, let me try that. So, can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Okay, so um, I, I think I, I just prepared a short presentation uh, because I wanted to uh, highlight a couple of things. But uh, some of this stuff I kind of already spoke through. So I'm not going to take too much time, but I'm just going to make a couple of points. So I've named this presentation Turkey, it's a Nobel laureates. And so, uh, so, uh, so what I wanted to talk about is the <clears throat> concept of hidden risk, right? Um, and this is something I tried to talk about you when, when I answered your first question, that this is risk that is not obvious in any trading strategy. And when I say a trading strategy, I don't essentially mean that it has to be an algorithmic strategy or it has to be a rules-based strategy. Any strategy, fundamental investing is a strategy, right? It's a, it, this is the way you invest. There is certain things that are hidden that is not very obvious. And uh, this uh, was very brilliantly uh, kind of shown by Nassim uh, Nicholas Taleb in his uh, book, The Black Swan, right? And so we are going to refer to that to, to make, a, make a point. And we are also going to talk about uh, at, at in Capital Management Report. So, so consider this, right? So uh, consider a turkey, right? Uh, so this is the example that uh, Professor Talib gives so that uh, consider a turkey that from the day he was born, he's being fed every day. So every day at about a um, particular time, like uh, let's say 12, 12 in the noon, he's given food. So he has food the first day. So next day at 12, he expects food. And next day again, he gets food, right? So every day at 12 p.m. he's fed food in the, in the afternoon. And so as days progress, he becomes more and more and more convinced that the very next day, again at 12, he is going to get fed, correct? Because in his history, which in the case of a trader would be the back testing history, every day at 12 p.m. he has got food. So more the number of instances increase, the probability becomes more and more strong for him, right? So. So, so this is what psychologists call a positive feedback loop, right? That as the same thing happens over and over again, and you have a positive outcome based on a certain set of rules, you become more and more confident about that, that same thing happening again, right? But consider this, what happens to the turkey on Thanksgiving day? So for, let's say the turkey was born a year before Thanksgiving, and exactly for the last 364 days of the year, every day it has been fed, right? Fed. It has been fed good food, it has become big and fat, and it has come to expect that the very next day the same thing is going to happen again. But everything is fine till the day of Thanksgiving when the turkeys actually become somebody else's food, right? Now, this issue is strikingly similar to what investors sometimes get pulled into, or trading system developer, trading the system developers also get um, pulled into, that they, when a market like so continuously moves up or a market moves down, they expect the same thing to keep happening till all of a sudden the market changes direction and gives you a very rude shock, right? So, so this is a hidden risk. So you see um, th this graph that uh, kind of, uh, and this is a graph from this book, The Black Swan. Uh, so if we plot the, the turkey's well-being on, on the y-axis and the number of days, let's say on the x-axis, this is how the graph is going to look, right? So every day, since it's fed and it's becoming fatter and is given food, it, its well-being continuously increases, right? And its probability of a well-being also continuously increases because as I say, in its history, the history you look at, 
there only been one event that is gets consumably fed at 12 p.m. Right till the day it stops happening. So the point I'm trying to make is that things like this happen in the market, right? Uh, we have seen it in the 2008 crash. We have seen it in the coronavirus crash that things can become very bad, very fast without any kind of pre-warning, right? So the, every time you are in the market, there is a risk and no amount of formulas or value at risk or expected shortfall or using extremely complex formulas or following what some big trader has written somewhere, right, is going to, will ever stop you from having to experience this risk. This risk is very real. This list, this risk needs to be taken care of, right? And that's the reason I say uh, that whenever you bet something, such a surprise might be coming for you also. When you bet, bet enough so that it, it's worthwhile, but never bet more than you can lose. Because sometimes you might see those things like this happening. And this is not just for you and me or, or uh, retail investors or novice investors. I'm going to give an example of long-term capital management, right? So they were a huge hedge fund. They almost had billions, $4.2 billion in their kitty. And they had on their board two Nobel laureates, right? So they had, uh, you had heard of the Black and Scholes uh, model of option pricing. Uh, Black and Merton uh, went on to win the Nobel Prize for uh, this Black Scholes model of option pricing. They were parts of long-term capital management. They were one of the, some in, in, in they were, okay, let, let, let's just say this, they were involved very uh, closely with the long-term capital management and uh, they were fully responsible for all of those trading strategies that long-term capital management use, right? Now, you might think, okay, these guys are the absolute best of the best, right? These guys, uh, they're Nobel laureates for God's sake, right? How better can somebody be when it comes to modeling risk and stuff, right? Now, this is what happened to long-term capital management. The blue line is long-term capital management. The assets and the management for long-term capital management. The red is the Dow Jones and the uh, yellow is the US Treasury. Does not this uh, blue curve look very similar to the Turkey curve that uh, Nassim Taleb uh, showed about the, how, how, how uh, Turkey lives its life? And till the day, how everything looks good. Everything looks hunky-dory till the day they get a shock. Right now, so why why this thing happened to long-term capital management? You know why it happened? It happened because they were betting. So you see, they were Nobel laureates. They had PhDs. They had 500, maybe I don't know, 50 PhDs on the, on the all from the top U.S. colleges and stuff. They thought that they can develop such complex risk yielding uh, formulas that they can actually predict market risk. They could not because the, in, the, in the actual thing, they were doing a lot of option selling and they had uh, uh, expectations of correlations that, okay, this price, the Russian ruble is not correlated with, uh, let's say, crude oil. And so I can, so not, not both of them are going to go down at the same time. So based on that, they had the risk model and based on the risk model, they had a heavily leveraged trades. And they thought their model was perfect because, again, as I'm saying, they're Nobel laureates for God's sake, right? How can their model be different? They lost everything in two days, just two days of trading. The fund value became zero. If it can happen to them, it can most definitely happen to us. The only way to avoid this is to uh, risk only what you can risk. And not kind of get caught up too much into different formulas, different what some uh, um, uh, trader is saying, or what you hear in the newspaper, or whatnot, right? So, 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 and a couple of so this was the main point I wanted to make. A, a couple of uh, uh, other points, related points, right? So, how how do you ensure this, right? How do you bet enough, but how how do you uh, not risk too much, right? 
So the, I, I think the risk control should begin with maintaining individual trades, uh, trade risk, and you should try to develop a portfolio of non-correlated trading strategies. Developing non-correlated trading strategies is not easy at all. It's much easier said than done. But at least what you can do, because whether it's correlated or not, you, can only, you will only find out when you trade it in real life. When you backtest it, everything is going to look non-correlated, right? It's only, but if you don't know what the future is going to hold, right? No matter how intelligent you are, it is, uh, there's no shame in accepting that we are basing our trading on past data while we are trying to trade the future. It's like driving a car by looking only at the rear view mirror, right? And that's what traders do. That's what all of us do. Because we cannot look up front. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. The best we have is what has happened in the past. But think of what will happen if you drive a car by just looking at the rear view mirror. You're going to crash, right? So expect to crash when you are trading in the markets, no matter how big you are. If the Nobel laureates can lose everything in two days, sure as hell we can. So it's better to be safe. So try to maintain individual trade risk. Try to maintain individual trade risk because there are going to be price shocks. It is very difficult to predict. Nobody can predict it. If somebody says that they have predicted it successfully, they're either lying or they're the plane they don't know what they're speaking about. For example, a price shock said what happened in 9-11, the terrorist attack here in New York, or what happened in corona, during the coronavirus case, right? This is just a couple of months old. It's impossible to predict, right? So the traders must realize that this kind of events are there. So sometimes even if you have been somehow profitable in, in uh, such a bad event, you might as well have lost the exact same amount. So these are very scary uh, day, uh, very scary um, periods of trading. So it's best to be very careful. So now I'm going to <clears throat> talk through very quickly uh, some practical insights. So this has nothing to do with math, nothing to do with AI. This is just when you trade for a living, what as an individual trader you possibly need to follow. Do not hold a position longer than necessary. That's that's obvious, right? That because the more you're in the market, the more you're exposing yourself to risk, right? Because a trading system that is in the market for only 40% of the time has, has a 60% chance of avoiding a price shock, right? So don't stay in the market unless you need to be. Uh, a very famous trader used to say, not having a position, not being in the market is also a position. Staying in cash is a position, right? You don't have to trade all the time. And uh, another point is try to make as much as possible by investing as little as possible. How do you do that? And this is the point that we discussed, right? That try to look for very high risk reward um, areas of trading where you can risk uh, a little amount, but you can expect to win a big, uh, big portion so that even if you make a couple of trades wrong or even three trades wrong, four trades wrong, one big win should uh, kind of make up for all of that and still leave a little bit more. So, so it is very critical to look out for high risk reward uh, trading setups. Uh, so generally uh, um, uh, a very easy follow through of this style of trading is a trend following trading system, right? Because in trend following you take a lot of small, you're ready to take a lot of small losses, but Sometimes when you win, you win big, right? That this, I think, when following trading strategies are inherently risk averse in nature. Because the very tenet of trend following is that you should be ready to take small losses. Keep taking the small losses till you have a, a, a big uh, winning system, a big winning outcome. That is generally for a Again, a retail trader or a novice trader or an initial um, a trader who is just kind of uh, getting into full-time trading, a very good way to trade, trying to pick up a trend. Uh, and some of these points on this slide uh, I have already spoken through. Risk only a small amount. Uh, determine the maximum loss for the current trade in advance. So this is the point I made when I said that you back test it. See your maximum historical drawdown. and base everything on that. So if your mass maximum historical drawdown is 10%, expect that sometime in the future, 
you are going to hit a 20% drawdown. So position size in a way that when you hit that 20% drawdown, you will lose so much that you have to stop trading, right? So you should stay alive to trade one more day, right? You should have, you should keep your capital enough so that you can still trade uh, on a different day. So um, it makes sense to be very risk averse um, uh, uh, when it comes comes to trading. So having an idea of a maximum loss that you can have is very important. Exit a trade quickly, and this is again uh, the same point. That don't stay in the market unless you have to. If your profit target is hit. If your stop loss that you had is crossed, just exit. Uh, don't expect that the price is going to move up further to give you a bigger profit, or the price is going to move back up so that it moves again up over your uh, stop loss. It just doesn't work in the long run. It might give you a profit, a little bit more profit on a particular day, saving a little bit of a loss on the other day. But in generally, if you don't uh, follow those rules strictly, sooner or later, you're going to have a catastrophic loss. So it's best not to uh, do that. And uh, as I said, uh, be consistent with your trading philosophy. Uh, if, if you're in a losing trade, um, kind of square off your positions when the time comes to square off your positions. Uh, do not ho hold on to positions unnecessary. And by and large, uh, overall, trade a system whose risk profile is compatible with your overall life. So if you are doing a day job and you're trading only on the side, trade a system or trade in a way that if you lose enough, it doesn't you don't take too much of a hit. If you are only trading part time, trade accordingly, right? Don't trade a system where it requires continuous uh, looking at the markets and continuous modifications. Because if you're trading part-time, you cannot give that time. And it might so happen that since you are not able to give time, you made a big loss because you're supposed to exit, but you, you, could, you were not front, in front of the computer at that point of time. So trade a system which is in, in line with your life, with your goals, and with your overall um, comfort, level of comfort with the amount of risk. You would notice that in this all this uh, 15 minutes I spoke, and even the answers that I gave before, uh, that uh, <clears throat> I never talked about returns, right? I'm only talking about risk because if you get the risk portion correct, uh, you will get returns. The returns will follow. But if you lose too much, you're just going to go out of the market, right? Sooner or later. So um, great traders, and this is not, I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking of really, really great traders, right? The people from whom we all learn. They, they say that they always, looked at maintaining the downside. They did not worry about the upside because if you can maintain the downside, you can follow rules, the upside takes care of itself. You make money overall in the long term. So I will end my presentation with a, a quote from a very famous trader. His name is Ed Sekota. Um, he's uh, in, for many, uh, is considered to be the kind of the, the founding fathers of systematic trading. Uh, so he's from US, United States. Uh, so he, he made a, a very pertinent comment that has been uh, very important to me, at least in the way I trade uh, and how I have learned about trading. I'm still learning. Uh, he said that the markets are fundamentally volatile. There is no way around it. Your problem is not the math. There is no math to get you out of having to experience uncertainty. So when you're in the market, there is a lot of uncertainty. No math, no system, no strategy, no uh, trading guru, no person coming on the TV and saying, do this, do that. It can stop you from actually having to experience uncertainty. When you have a position and the prices fluctuates, the feel, and, and let's say you have a long position and the prices drop, the, the feeling that you have at the bottom of your stomach, nobody can stop you from having to experience that. And so Ed Sekoda finally kind of summarized it in a brilliant line. He said, no matter what maths you use, you will end up measuring risk with your gut. So ultimately, you should only trade where you're comfortable in your gut with putting those positions in because the maths and the formulas are not going to save you. They did not save long-term capital management. They did not save, no save Nobel laureates. It doesn't save the turkey which gets slaughtered on Thanksgiving. It's neither going to save you. 
Okay, so that was my presentation. Thanks for listening in. Wow, thank you. Thank you, Rito, for that. That's, um, that's very interesting, especially the story for LTCM, which um, yeah. I also personally uh, watched a documentary about, and it was quite surprising that even the best minds could not, um, could not be able to predict what happened in the late 90s, getting into the year 2000. So thank you so much for that. A lot to take yeah. um, from your presentation. Um, and I'm sure even our guests as well. Um, if you have any, any questions that you would like to ask our guest, Mr. Rito, uh, kindly uh, put that in the Q&A section and we'll see whether we can um, have him answer one or two questions due to time. Maybe we'll only take two questions. So Mr. Mutahi, my colleague, will take over the Q&A session. And as we wait for the questions, for you, Mr. Rito, um, from your uh, professor experience at World Quant University, which trading books would you recommend to novice and seasoned traders on risk management and investing, both for short term and long term? I know you've mentioned the Black Swan. Uh, kindly give us other books that you could recommend. Yeah, so um, if you ask me, I think one a set of trading books everyone should read is, um, is the Market Wizard series by Jack Swagger, right? I, I always have it with me wherever I sit, I should be having one. Yeah, so that's that book. This, this is this book, right? Market Wizards. So he has an entire series of books like Market Wizards, New Market Wizards, Hedge Fund Market Wizards. Um, these are essentially interviews with top traders. So you learn more from actually listening to the, uh, the actual guys who have succeeded than you learn from just uh, uh, books on trading systems or formulas, right? So they, uh, so they actually, these are real traders who have left their life and only traded professionally. What things they have gone through, what, they have, what, what, has, what has worked for them, what has not worked for them, right? Many of them have gone through periods of drawdowns. Many of them have made losses. And then they have learned uh, some valuable lessons and that they share with you. So this, I think, is the most important set of books on trading. So I did not mention any trading about trend following trading system, mean reversion, algorithmic trading, or uh, how to model high frequency price patterns. I'm saying to just hear out the actual traders who were successful, right? So this, this according to the market visit books, series of books, according to me are the best set of books that I should, I can recommend, yeah. Um, Mr. Rita, so where can we find you? Where can people go to find your work uh, besides from your LinkedIn profile? Um, do you have any publications online? Kindly give us the links to those. All details are already actually given on my LinkedIn, but in, in, in addition to LinkedIn, so we obviously have our company site, which is truerisklabs.com. My publications are available on SSRN. So uh, uh, SSRN, I have a um, publication profile. So um, all my publications are there. I will, I will have to just uh, look at it and give you the link. So view author page. So this is my link. Shall I paste it here? I yes, think I yes, paste you can it here. paste it on the, on, also yeah. on the chat. Yeah, so I, I, I just paste it in here. All right. And also, any other way to contact you in case um, our guests may have some uh, private questions for you? Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm absolutely fine. I'm happy because so that's one of the reasons I kind of teach, right? Because I, I um, kind of, uh, I feel very invigorated when people ask questions and we can, because I'm uh, always learning something by talking to people. So you can just email me. So you don't have my email. So if you, uh, so you, uh, you please feel welcome to kind of share my email ID with everybody. I will type it in here also. I'm happy to talk. I just, I just type in my email ID. So I'm happy to talk and discuss and whatnot. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Rito, for giving us your time today and for that wonderful presentation. We'd also like to thank Scope Markets for hosting us and being able to host this show. And to all our participants who also made the time to be here. I know it's a Friday afternoon, but thank you. And I'm sure that you have gained some wealth, a wealth of knowledge today. 
So thank you to everyone and tune in for the next one. We will be communicating when the next webinar will be hosted. So thanks again. Enjoy your afternoon. Mr. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All the best to you and enjoy the weekend. Okay. Bye bye. Trade safely. <laughs> All right. All right <laughs> okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks guys for tuning in and sticking with us to the end. We hope you have learned something new. I would like to appreciate Scope Markets for sponsoring this webinar. Remember, you can open a live trading account with Scope Markets and apply the lessons shared by the guest in this webinar to your trading. Many thanks to our guests for speaking to us. We'll be open to have you in the future. Till next time, goodbye.